Welcome to Tech Night, the Northwest North 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 Amateur Radio Club. Mike's going to do a slight introduction, and we'll go from there. Uh, tonight, we're going to do a session on tower climbing, uh, courtesy of PJ and Joe. And if you are a member of the ARL and you got this month's issue of QST, the lead article talks about terrible tower lessons and, and, and the risks that you take doing it. So they're going to tell us the right way to do it so that our name doesn't show up in one of these articles in the future. All right. So we appreciate that they're going to do all this prep and, and, and uh, we're going to learn a lot tonight. Take it away. Whoever's got the lead. Thank you very much. Give Thank me one you. second to get the screen share up. Cool. All right, we're going to test the clicker. Clicker works. And we'll aim the camera back with the front. Good evening, everybody. As we know, I'm BJ, Cap or okay. CDR. This is Joe, KM4 UDS. We are the president and vice president of the Local Cool Sandwich Radio Club. So thank you very much for coming out. And the rest of the officers and his team guests here. And if you're new here, Scott, thank you very much for coming. We do appreciate you being here. And it's nice to see some old and familiar faces in the crowd again. So thank you for coming back in. It's great to have you guys back in here. Uh, so tower climbing and safety. Well, we've got the patches up there for three clubs and the ARL affiliated clubs because they are all affiliated clubs in the area. And all these clubs in this immediate area have a giant impact on towers on your personal property, at the club repeater station sites, at, at your other areas where you have clubhouses, everywhere that you go, these three clubs have the impact. These three clubs have participated in most of the area uh, towers or their or repeated repairs uh, as far as North Oklahoma Playground Amateur Radio Club and Walton County Amateur Radio Club goes. So Joe and I and uh, ko 4 k who's not here tonight, uh, we've been out to many of these sites and we've done a lot of work to keep amateur radio in the area actually going and actually in the air. And we've also visited other clubs in other areas, uh, <laughs> such as the Deep South Amateur Radio Club, the Southern Amateur Radio Union, uh, a couple other clubs out there in Andalusia, things like that. And that's what some of these pictures are up here. Mike, there's a laser printer on this, right? There we go, okay. So you'll see the Playground Amateur Radio Club tower right there. You'll see a tower in Andalusia, another tower in Andalusia, there's two. And then this is one of the same ones with the second picture here. Uh, this one is about 200 feet in the air. This one, Joe, was what, 175? 175. 175. Uh, that's a still from a drone video that we'll show here in a little while. This one is at about, uh, this one is the 200 foot tower. And this one is at about 63 and a half feet right there to the base plate of the rotor. Uh, so that's where that one is. And then here's some other stills from uh, the video from that one. And then we've got some personal towers, people's yards, things like that, work we've done. We've got M4CU's tower pictured and sharing that. Uh, just because of how awesome and what it is at his house, that it, I've never seen it put all the way up. Uh, I just I would love to see that one day. And then we've got a section of a piece of tower being removed from when we tore down Playground Edge Radio Clips Tower because it was the leaning tower for Walton Beach. To summarize that real quick, basically what had happened was it was already leaning a little bit two and a half, three years ago. Hurricane Sally came through November of 2020. Everybody should remember that one because of Sanska hitting the Pensacola Bridge. Right, and the tower took a wind hit and it decided to lean over more. So we went in and we assessed the situation and we elected to moor it to a telephone pole and two vehicles with chains and guy wires to straighten it back up, replace hardware, and then climb up to the top, disassemble the beams, bring them down safely, and drop down the rest of the tower. And then we bought the replacement tower right thereafter and then put that back in its place. And that took total project time because of the heat days and also it was called beat the heat if anybody remembers those emails that went out right we had no less than six clubs worth of people so it's hard to tell in this picture i know i apologize about the size of it you can kill the light right over the screen yeah but in this picture here that one there we go in this picture here you will see literally six clubs worth of people helping to tear down this tower so we tried to re-image, re redo that every time we went to a tower and involve as many clubs as possible when we had a large scale project, all right? Trying to say, hey, we're here to help you. We're here to teach you the right way. We're here to do all this stuff. I wouldn't know anything about any towers if it wasn't for Joe, honestly. I got involved with him. He asked me out on one job. I fell in love with doing it. And I was like, this is great. Let's, let's have some fun with it. All right, so 
Uh, the travel timeline, right? Where do we go? You can see that we even have antennas, antenna arrays on top of buildings. This is KO4NKL. He is on top of the Edwin Federal Credit Union in uh, Fort Walton Beach. That's where the two meter and 70 centimeter repeater are for there. We've done work there. We just recently had to straighten the two meter repeater up there. Ted had to go up there because that last windstorm that came through three weeks ago actually took that antenna and it bent it over five degrees. The bracket came loose, so that had to be fixed, straightened up, all that other stuff. Uh, and then you can see up here, you got Joe trying to hang this really massive long antenna, which is this one. I nailed it, though. And you nailed it, right? So that's <laughs> so he nailed it. We had to go back up a second time because it got a lightning hit, but that's okay. Ooh. Yeah, a light, lightning what, strike what, on what it. What was that? That's Andalusia. Oh, okay. and that's the repeat. other one in Andalusia. Now, if you look and see how many guy wires are on this one, this picture doesn't show representative of anything crazy, but right below this line on the picture here, there is a house that is two feet from this tower mast. And it's a two-story house, okay? So the two-story gable roof, the pitch of it goes up to 60 feet. So you've got 60 feet of wall to climb along with the tower before you even get up to the crest of the roof to climb up the other 100 and some odd feet to get to the top of that tower up there. And that's one where we were doing an emergency repair or a drop down because there was an antenna got damaged in a storm and it was basically free hanging on coax and it was posing a threat to the house. So we had to go over there and safety that. And then the rest of it, they wanted us to tear the whole tower down. After assessing it, after we got the wind damage thing taken care of, uh, we, we couldn't do it. It was too close to the house. We didn't have enough right equipment, it weighed too much. We had to tell them, we're sorry, but you need to get a crane. You, you need to have a professional crew come in and do this. So there are those instances. All right, so tower uh, climbing, and I'm sorry, go ahead. And if you do anything like that, make sure you get the engineer planes. Uh, Ron is really good um, with their website. You can get their engineer plans. It comes from Ron 25 to Ron 20, uh, 45, and it's the same plans. Uh, get those engineer plans before you can climb or think about climbing or when you're about to assimilate a tower. There's a reason for those. And a lot of people don't realize, oh, I'm only have, only have 40 feet. I'm going to attach to the house. <laughs> okay. What part of the house are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to attach to my E. Well, I used to build houses. Those E's is only nailed down with only two 16 penny nails. That's it. That is not going to hold your tower. So just remember, please get those engineer plans as for, for your neighbors, for your house, and for your safety. So please pull up those plans and they're really easy to follow. Yes, sir. So you explain what an engineer plan is? Yeah, engineer plans will tell you what type of bolts you should be using, what type of guidelines you should be using, the thickness and the quality of the guidelines, how thick and um, deep your foundation should be on your tower. It, it nails it's everything down. The tower. Requirements of what the tower requires for support. Yes. yes. Or a given wind load. Or when, given or wind loads. Uh, if you want to increase your wind loads, there is a chapter on there to uh, to uh, de increase your wind loads. It depends on what size tower you have. Yes. If it's all the same plan for all of the Rome towers. Most no. Most of the Rome towers. Most. The smaller ones, the Rome twenty fours. Yep. All the way to the 45 is the same um, plans. Would you would somebody kindly put the PDF link on our website? There's like 75 to 80 pages. Um, I we probably can probably put well, the link put to it. To right, exactly. So we'll point a link to the website for okay. Brown okay. or, or and, and you'll see on the internet. Facebook pages, ham radio pages, people say, I'm gonna put up a tower. What do I need to put for foundation? Oh, you just need six inches by four by four. <laughs> yeah. And, and no. no, you 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 do it exactly according to the manufacturer's recommended foundation plan. So especially if you go recommended in, rebar plan. Especially if you go on two hundred feet because Yeah, forty feet is is you go over a lot, but you go above 40 feet. Right, but why must say five years from now, you want to add another 60 feet? If you don't do it the right way. Right. So that's why I always say go buy your the engineer plans on there because this is a growing hobby. We want to grow. You might say, well, 40 feet is going to work for me for the next five years. Two years later, you say, 
ooh, that nice hex beam looks really good. I bet that sounds really good on my tower, but I got to go another three sections to put this hex beam up. So just uh, put a thought on that. All right. So safety climbing and gear, right? So harnesses. You want to choose something that is comparable, that's certified, right? So you'll see up there, if you can read it across the room, you'll talk about what the rings connector, the connectors, the sling and certifications of it are. Every harness that's built right now, when you buy from a reputable company, has a four or five year shelf life. That's important, okay? So you bought a harness in 2014. Did you use it? No, it sat in the closet. 2019 comes around. Is that harness any good? Top quiz, answer is no. Why is it no good? Because it's not certified past five years. If you use it, you fall, and you try to sue that company, guess what? They're going to inspect that harness on the accident incident report. No good. So your harnesses, you want to check them. You want to make sure you have your D-rings. You want to make sure you have emergency clips. You want to make sure you have your shoulder straps, your back straps, and your waist strap, and your belt. You want to make sure none of that is framed. There's also the retention strap. This is the one that goes around in the D-rings on your waist, on your belt, around the tower, okay, and onto your belt. Muscle memory is absolutely 100% important. The way you practice on the ground is the way that you do it on the tower. If you use your left hand to disconnect this while you're putting your securing straps onto the tower to get this around a piece of guy wire, you want to use the same left hand and the same motion every single time. Never, ever, ever deviate. The one time that you do, oh, it'll be okay this time, is the one time that you have a problem. You do not want to have a problem at anything above 20 feet because anything above 20 feet will kill you and if you fall. And also, if you do have a box hole or something in your way, bring two. So some of these materials that they're made out of, they're not that expensive. Okay, you can get a decent tower rig for around $300. All right, now there's some accessories that we want to have. Helmets, carabiners, tools, tool bags, pulleys, right? You want to have some straps that you can wrap around, apparatuses, antenna, pipes, poles, coax, anything that you're going to haul up. You want to have these accessories because it's just going to make your life easier. The ground crew. And the ground crew is going to be able to better facilitate helping you. Connectors and sizing. There's three main options in connectors. There's the tongue buckle, the pass-through buckle, and the quick neck buckle, okay? So a tongue buckle is like this right here, okay? A snap buckle is that, right? A D-ring buckle is wait, on the back here. The back, yeah. It's right here on the back. You can come up and look at this here if you want, but there's a D-ring buckle back here. Each D-ring is rated for a different class of weight. So you have to look at what's your body weight, what's your BMI, and what's your musculoskeletal weight. And you have to put that into the calculation when you're choosing these components. Up to 200 pounds is not good for most people, okay? That's not 200 pounds of resistance, that's 200 pounds of person. And add 10%. And then add 10%, exactly, thank you very much. So if you, let's say that you weigh a sprying 220 pounds, you wanna have one that's good to 260 because you want that extra added security. If you end up hanging on your harness, you can only hang in your harness for 15 minutes before you start cutting off the circulation and end up to a real problem up there. That means if you get stuck on a tower and you're hanging there like this, or your arms are down and you're stuck on your emergency harness, which is this piece right here, these things are elastic. They stretch out one time. They stretch out one time, they're bad. Even if it's an incident that we didn't down. fall, if it's an incident where you step on it or it tolls on something else for some reason, those things got to be replaced. And you're done. You're done for the day. But if you're hanging there, right and or you're not unconscious you've got to do everything you can to get back on that tower and pull yourself towards that tower recenter okay if you're hanging there and you're unconscious your ground spotter or your spare climber your second climber has 15 minutes or less to scurry up that tower and secure you to the tower and still call emergency mm -hmm. services okay something happens rob you're calling emergency services we're going up and getting joe Emergency services show up. Yes, sir. I had a great uncle that died in his alignment, um, and he was suspended upside down in his 30s, you know, blew an aneurysm. Yeah. So it, it's, you're lucky if you're, you're head, head up and, and yes. strapped in. Absolutely. Hey, BJ. Sir. Let me let me tell you about here. Um, 
So we used to fund the thousand foot tower and the 300 foot tower on the range. I used to have the 300 foot tower. And so we were dealing with procurement and they're always interested in buying a nickel. So they bought parts for us. They bought D-rings and beaners and straps. And they were rated for the weights that we told them. Mm -hmm. When we got them in, the first thing we did was the, the crew chief inspect them. All of them were stamped. You knew what they were stamped for, right? Do not climb. Not for human. Uh, no, yeah. What the hell are they good for? But you got to be. Some of these knockoffs come from overseas. And, and that's what I was going to mention after after this. And my uh, my my buddy out at the in Utah that does the search and rescue stuff. They got some aluminum ones that were like professional ones. But wherever they bought them through the same kind of thing, they were counterfeit. And when they actually were doing training with a with a simulated uh, cadaver, they you know, trying to go down the mountain and pull it down they they just they get like spaghetti so really you can only get reputable ones pay the full price it's worth your life the carabiners that you buy at walmart those <laughs> Home Depot, aluminum they are good for what tools cool that's it yeah. i would you know because you can yell down on the radio headache 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 and people will hopefully not be at the center without a heart head on they can walk away and, there you go walk away in a straight line don't be like headache 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 what <laughs> because by the time you look up, that wrench is through your head like a watermelon. And that's not a pretty sight, right? All right, next slide. So tower climbing and safety gear continued. Positioning. When working on a tower, getting the job done while well only using one hand is nearly impossible. That's why positioning lanyards, mentioned earlier, are super important, right? You want to have these things. Now, if you're in an area where you're in a tower and it goes tapers inward, right? You're not going to adjust your belt while you're climbing this tower. You're going to take your belt, you're going to wrap it around the road and position yourself where you need to be, clip it back on your D ring, and then resume your work. You're not going to keep working with it hanging loose where you're just swaying in the wind. It doesn't work like that. Even if you've got your emergency D rings up above you, once you get all these things ropes, pulleys, lanyards, carabiners, tools, buckets, bags, whatever, all in front of you. You've got a lot going on in a very small area. The last thing you want to do is have to worry about your balance, right? So that's positioning and positioning lanyards. There's a lot of types of them, but they're made out of free materials and they're made of non-stretch webbing, right? The reason for non-stretch webbing is so that it doesn't slack out on you. You don't want that to happen because it can get wet, it can fray, do all those things. Speaking of frays, if you inspect this, and you see a fray anywhere on it, whether it's on the outer casing or it's on the inner sheath, you don't want to reuse it. You want to spend the 30 bucks and get a new one. And, and most of them has a, a mark on them. So if they start to fade, see how this one's starting to do a little bit? There's a black line and it cannot pass that line. If it passes that line, it's time to get a new one. So most of your safety equipment will have markings like this to let you know when to replace your gear. This is a fall arrest device. That's the official name for this. Okay. The same standards and rules apply to your fall arrest devices as do to your positioning lanyard and, and your position ascended. Now, why is that important? That's important because, like I said earlier, if you stretch this out one time, it's bad. But guess what? If you put this into your tower bag or your tower box or a kit, whatever you keep it in, or with a tote or anything, and you set something else on it, if you're throwing your wrenches in, you're tired. You've been working on a tower for six hours. You take the gear, you throw it in, you throw your tools on top of it. Next thing you know, you got a drill, throw your drill down the drill bit, catch the end of it, you and you didn't notice it, and you go get on the next tower, you're excited because, man, I want to get up there, I want to get this done. This is awesome, having a great time. If you didn't inspect this and it's spraying, you better believe, hopefully, your buddy check on your the ground check. caught it, right? Because then you're not climbing. Or you're going to have a bad day if you need to depend on this. You really just don't want to. All right. Last thing, casting hoist. Uh, as a tower climber, no doubt, the lifting heavy equipment is something that you'll have to do. These are portable lifting devices that fit in the hard access areas on job sites. So you want to look for a new hoist mount or some other accessory. GME, GME Supply has got you covered. Now, the only reason I say GME Supply is because that's an American company, and that's where most of my gear came from. I don't know if that's where yours came from. But GME has all the non-perlipidated stuff. 
it's the real deal. This stamp, every piece has the identifying tag on it. It goes corresponding. My harness is married to my belt, which is married to my positioning strap, which is married to my D-ring, which is married to my belt, my leg, my leg belts, right? If one of the, and most of those components are replaceable, but when I do that and I order from them, I have to call them and tell them, mine is stamped this date. And they have, and I have to put that on there with my knowledge or they recommend I buy a new one. All right, tower climbers and ground crew, highly important. Why is the ground crew important? Well, the ground crew is the muscle behind the tower job. So if you're up on a tower and you got an antenna that you want to put up a hex beam of two meter, 440 mm -hmm. vertical, an HF vertical, whatever it be, a regular, a big old beam, right? Whatever it is, they're the ones that are on the ground that are going to be using the ground pulley. That's this thing right here. I know it's a little low, I'm sorry. Uh, but you're gonna, they're gonna feed the rope through that. They're gonna tie it off to it. They're gonna put the positioning rope. They're gonna have a tag line. And up top is a pulley on top of the tower, right? Another, and the rope goes through this. The ground crew, which is why you see so many people, are gonna be doing the lifting because the guy on the tower is the one that's supposed to be hauling that weight. You're supposed to be there for positioning as final assembly. That means everything on the ground's got to be tuned, tested, and ready to go. So you should have already tested it on a vertical ground mount and have it ready to go. That way there's no SWR adjustment nuts having to come loose and do this in small little pieces. You don't have a bad wire. You don't yank out the end of a type end connector. <laughs> Not us, other people, while it's being hauled up, right? If you're gonna install a jumper on a hard line from the hard line to the antenna, install it up top after you've tested the whole line down on the ground with the entire assembly in an operational configuration. I say that because you want to haul it up in pieces rather than one when you have a feed line attached to it because the odds of that feed line not making the trip up are very, very high. We learned our lesson two hours later. All right, but all employees should certify and commitment for 100% tie off. What does that mean? That means that if you're on the ground and you're on the ground crew and you've got a rope, and I wish I had a piece of rope right now to show you, and you've got this rope and you're holding this up right here, you need to have a tie-off coin. This chair right here to hold that asset in place so that you're not standing there because what happens? If you hold a glass of water out five minutes, you're not gonna care. If you hold a glass of water out for an hour and a half, it's gonna start dropping regardless that it's the same weight, right? So the same thing happens when you're holding on the rope, and that can cause flux. You're going to wear yourself out, and the next thing you know, this guy or this guy, we're up there trying to put this antenna on. You drop that rope, boom, and down it goes. And we're trying to instinctively react to not let the object fall. It's an instinct. It's very hard to not let that happen. There's been instances where we have needed to put ourselves aside and say, okay, this is falling. And just let go. And what happens, happens. Because you don't want to jeopardize yourself while you're up anywhere above, you know, probably 40, 50 feet. 40 or 50 feet is recoverable. But if you get above, above that and you've got an asset that's coming down because the rope isn't at a tie-off point, it's not a good day. Well, you also, also got to think, how, how, how tall is your ceiling in your house? Depends on the house. Eight foot, ten foot ceilings, right? Times two is what? 20, about 20 feet. Are you going to get on a 20 foot roof and jump off of it? Nope. <laughs> so there's the <laughs> so the Okay. <laughs> Tower climber and your ground crew. So your ground crew is responsible for all communications to the tower crew. They advise you of the weather. They advise you of anything coming up. They advise you of the wind. The wind speed is very important. There was one tower we were on, and it was figure eights because out of nowhere, a windstorm came up. Only thing we can do to anchor is pull ourselves to the center of the tower and be about nose to nose and be like, hey, how you doing? And that was it for, for about 20 minutes until this wind decided to die down. Then we reassessed the weather and then we proceeded with work. Fortunately, we were able to proceed work and not have to climb down. Now we have been on a tower when another right. storm rolled in and we did what's called an emergency descent. And we informed our ground crew. We see a thunder cell coming at us with an amazing pace. We are going to emergency descent. We shuffled down all of our tools in an immediate hurry, and we emergency descended off that tower. You guys would have thought we were repellers. 
<laughs> Seriously, and we did this down at Fort Walton Beach. It was me and Joe. We looked over at this cloud and we're like, nope, get down. And that was pretty much the conversation. Drop, Emergency drop. descent, drop, drop, drop. And that's as fast as it went. And before the final word drop was out of his mouth, I was off the tower and he was right behind me. Oh. Ground crew does two things before the tower climb. They go around and they make sure that if it does have guidelines, that the guidelines are secure. They also do a representative safety briefing. They lay out the expectations of what the climbers are supposed to do, and they lay out the expectations of what the ground crew is going to do. Okay, so for instance, Ed, Maria, Queenie, you guys are the ground crew. All right, here's your here's how you're going to give your briefing. This tower is X amount high. The weather conditions are this. We have this equipment that we're going to put it up. We're going to utilize this rope that's rated at X pounds of force. And we're going to be pulling this up only after the tower climber gets the ghost. And if anyone disagrees or have any questions, stop the project right there. Um, because there's a lot of intelligent people out there that you might not even see. Because you might have that tunnel vision. You want that your beam up on that tower. And you don't care what it's going to take. But you have that tunnel vision. And if you have a helper say, hey, you know, you got this oak tree over here that might interfere or something like that. Oh, no, no, it's going to be fine. <laughs> no, it, it's not going to get in the way, which happened to me so many times. Because if your climber is up on that tower, holding on for his life with, the, with bent knees, do you want that climber to sit there for two and a half hours so you can get that beam out of that tree? Sure. So one of the things I alluded to earlier about the ground crew was safety, right? How close to the base of the tower, if the tower is 100 and something feet, should you be without a hard hat? 100 feet. Huh? 100 feet. It's usually about half the distance of the height of the tower. So if you are on, let's say, 150 tall tower, 75 feet. If you are within a 75 feet diameter circle of that tower, Hard hat. If they don't have hard hats, hopefully you have a spare or you tell them they got to stay back. That's very important because that can quickly eliminate the amount of people that you have on your ground crew. Did you wear them up? Oh, yeah. This, there's a climbing helmet. So there's a ground helmet, which is thick, and then there's a climbing helmet, which is has a chin strap, has required and all that stuff. I've always taken my hat off because it blocks my vision. Well, as you can yeah. see on the dents, the obstacles I had to go around. And this is to protect your head when you climb it up in case you hit your head on some obstacles or say you slip, fell. Wrenches without strings have been dropped. One on the one person, one on the person's back. Thank goodness it was only 18 feet, right? Any higher than that, he would have really messed them up. Important points all tower girdies you routinely expect, and I hit on this earlier, right? Helmets, harnesses, tools, ropes, pulleys, gym poles, shoes, boots, gloves, clothing, radios, cell phones, batteries, radios. Oh, I got a bow fang, whatever, I don't care if I screwed up for a radio. Why should you expect or have an independent tower radio? Because you want reliable communications. I didn't bring my radio tonight with my earpiece in it. Usually I do have that. I have a pouch that's on the back of my harness and I stick that sucker in there and then I bring my thing over. But you want to inspect that because you could be up there and you could have a loose battery clip and not know it. This has happened, right? And the battery falls off, next thing you know, your pounds are out. You can't talk. You're up 200 feet in the air. And these guys on the ground are like, you got the wind blowing. You, know what they're saying. you can't hear them, you know? Honestly, even if you're up 20 feet, once you get above the roof line of a house, you can't hear somebody, especially if they live near a busy road. Right, so you got to use radios, unless you just happen to have a voice that naturally carries, right? But that may only be one of you. Keep that in mind. Why would you want to have a cell phone on a tower job, up top, up on the tower with you as a climber? Why would you want to have one in your tool bag instead of hooked to your hip? Why would you want to have one? Well, because you may have a different problem that you can't communicate back down. If your radio battery fails, you want to be able to be up there. Also. It serves you very, very good diligence to have it for picture representation of exactly what you're talking about. Not that you're going to be up there texting, okay, but that you can snap a picture real quick 
and put it back in your bag. And when you go down, you can talk about, hey, here's what I saw. This is where the area of concern is. Thing. Okay, here's an up close picture of climbing it without having to use auxiliary methods, which we'll get into in just a moment. All right, important points continue. Uh, practice on the ground first, right? We talked about that. Always, when you get a harness, get it, inspect it, check it out. If it's bad for the vendor, send it back to the vendor. Then suit it up. Practice putting it on and off. Because the more repetition that you do, the more muscle memory form, right? You want to study the climbing techniques that are available. There are a ton out there. Use the reputable company stuff and not just some Yahoo on YouTube. Okay? You don't want to do that. All right? But there's a lot of different styles. There are some people, they climb hand over hand, opposite foot, following opposite foot, if you will. Okay? There are some people that have been doing it so long that they're professionals at it. And imagine the other hook like this in my hand, right? That this is their hand. And they're just using these to pull themselves up. That's great and well and fine, but if you slip once and stretch this out, guess what? It's bad, right? So that's not a good thing. But practice, 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 practice. And then when you're ready, climb a short tower or climb a short distance on the base of a tower to make sure you understand how your gear is going to operate. Even if you're one foot off the ground, get on there, get comfortable with your gear, get comfortable with your restraints, figure out how to move it around, figure out what's going to be your way. Pretend you're doing an actual tower job and clip yourself to it, clip your tool bag to where you think you're going to be working, and simulate what you're going to be doing. Because if you don't do that, right, then you're going to have a real problem when you go up even higher and you don't have a plan and you have no knowledge of what is going to be in your way, what's going to interfere with you. And I also believe in three points of contact. Always. Always three points of contact on that tower. Three points of contact means your feet, your hands, your positioning lanyard, and your emergency fall restraints. Yeah, I don't even okay. count my emergency uh, deflates because they are emergency deflates. Yep. Okay, I don't even count that. So you always want three points of contact. You can watch it. I've seen a couple of uh, YouTube videos. Guy looked like he was a tree climber that decides to climb this tower. He was just shuffling along. And I said, what happens if that harness break or he gets caught on a bolt on the tower? And something rips or something, you don't have that third contact. Where what's going to happen? So be careful of that. So we've hammered and hammered and hammered the safety of equipment, hammered and hammered and hammered positioning, hammered and hammered and hammered practicing. As you can tell, you don't want to climb until you do all that stuff. If you're nervous about it in any way, shape, or form, don't climb. I can't stress that enough. I had one guy, he's like, Oh, I'm afraid of heights, but I'm willing to try. Okay, great. So I took him over to Kurt's house. Kurt's got a 20 foot tower. I put him one foot in the air and the guy about messed his pants. Okay. No, so it I, happens. Don't right? be so shameful. It's, okay. it's not so shameful. It's not, nothing to be afraid. Nothing to be shameful. It's, it's not just nothing to be shameful. Are. So I, I got him off the tower safely and he's like, yep, I'm never doing this again. I said, okay, great. No problem. Understood because we were looking for another tower climber to come with us. Better there. Than but it's climb. better there at the one foot off the ground mark. Okay. Than it is. At a job site where you've got something to do and there's 200 feet of holy crap in your way. Yes, sir. Footwear. Footwear. Okay, so I boots. use military boots. So I use steel toe. Well, I use composite toes, but I so steel toe, composite toe, whatever. But my military boots that I use on a flight line are what I use. So I use aviation with, flight line boots with ankle. Yep, and they have a high rise ankle, all this jazz, tight laces, etc. I don't believe in zippers on them. Like that. Yeah, I've noticed if it's too much, just my tower, my yard. If it's too lightweight sneakers or what have you, it hurts like the dickens. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be up there for any length of time, you put on a tiny little. Um, Hold out your pinky. That's about the size of Roan. Unless you got a really big pinky. Yeah. But yeah, that's about the size of a Roan. And if you're standing on that for two hours, for longer, <laughs> for any, yeah, any amount of time, if you're standing on a piece of Roan for more than about 20 minutes, you're going to feel it. Yeah. So you want to have, you don't want those boots that have that metal brace in the bottom, by the way. If you want something flexible, and you're going to be shimmying around unless there's a tower step or unless you have like what Joe has, which is the butt seat, right? So you can just take the tension off of your feet. You can actually sit on it like it's an exercise. Hmm. Okay, so something else you want to do, we talked about the live communications earlier. I can't hammer on that one enough. You want to make sure that you have a primary tower radio and guess what? A backup tower radio. Who remembers hearing me always say I have a handheld disease? Some of you? None of you? Okay, well, Ed Beck could raise his hand. Kurt's lab, because he knows it's true. I have a handheld radio disease. Why do I have a handheld radio disease? Because ever since I've been around this knucklehead, I've been climbing towers with handhelds 
And I haven't destroyed any, but I always want to make sure I have a reliable radio. For me, believe it or not, and I'm not making this as a primary recommendation, the most reliable radio for me on a tower has been a Baofeng UB5R. Because it's cheap, it's durable, the battery lasts a very long time, and I can lock it and forget it, and I can do whatever. I've had problems with my Icon Kenwood Yesu and stuff like that up there. Don't want to deal with that. Yes, sir. A Baofeng took two dives off the tower at 300 foot and 100 foot, and they said to get out with a a pick to get the mud out of it, but hey, yeah, it still works. Well, even if it doesn't work, it's only 30 bucks, right? Okay, so something else you're going to want to do when you do it a tower before you go to that job. If you've never been to that job, all you can survey that area geographic, geographically, it needs great geographically with satellite views. You want to have pictures sent from the people who are asking you to help out. You want to arrange a pre climb visit if you can, if it's within the local area. All right, you want to use a drone. Huh. If you have this capability and this now, drone that he's holding up, will he can fly up a pilot around. Now the this is against drone rules and FAA regulations, stuff like that. Because you have to be licensed one if you're not using this thing as fun. That's basically what they broke break it down to. Oh, I know. I think it's fun, but it depends on. What so there is a a thin line when you fly a drone around these towers and stuff. Uh, so be careful if you do fly a drone around the area. Make sure you are licensed, especially if it's a commercial tower. Private, you know, it's your property or your friend's property. You know, you might can wave. They have to get a warrant first. It gives you the yeah. time to get rid of. But yeah, but what do you mean by license? I thought if you were have a ham radio license. No, no, no. We're talking about the drone. Oh the drone to drive the drone. drone. Pilot. Drone. Yes. Yeah. You have to have a pilot license to drive a drone. drone. As you can see, this is a registry drone. This is an actual aircraft. This is a legal aircraft. Okay. It's like a plane. This is just like a plane. It has its own number on it. Yes. This is an aircraft. On his phone right here, you guys are all live on his camera, by the way. He's got his drone powered up. He's not going to fly in here, but you can see this is how clear and good of a picture it is. So you can imagine what you can see by flying a drone so you don't have to risk somebody's life. Say you have a break in the tower leg. <laughs> on 178 in the tower. Yeah. You believe the guys, but they have a drone as well, and they sent you drone video and picture that they sent, but you need to see the opposite side, and there you have them been out they able to get out there because of weather. When you show up on your pre-inspection visit, guess what? You can take your drone out there, fly it up, and you can take a look at it and decide whether or not it's safe to climb past that point or to that point. Mm -hmm. Very important piece of that puzzle, right? So that's why it's important to have the picture sent and the pre-club visits or the pre-climb visits, pardon me. Uh, the weather, we talked about it earlier, very big in completing a job or not. Whether it's hot, whether it's cold, then in both environments. I can tell you right now, I would rather be cold than hot, but you don't want to be cold because if you're cold on the ground, it's even colder up top. The temperature can change every 15 feet. The wind can change every five feet in height. Make sure you're monitoring that. Your ground person, like if Ed was Joe right now, the other Joe, Joseph, right, KO4, okay? If Ed was Joe, he'd be on his phone every so many minutes checking that weather, checking that wind report, watching the wind meters in the area and things like that. We would normally call down every half hour, hey, can I get a weather report? Or if we saw something suspicious. Or, like one time, what was it, two years ago? So two years ago, we are in Andalusia. We are standing on top of this tower, and we are trying to put up this vertical mast. And we are we had to cinch it down to the top of the table. We had to basically pull ourselves and hold on, because we were doing this figure eight. Whoa. Right? Well, the top of the tower wasn't guided. It was guided down at the next section down. So the like wall we had 10 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet down because there was no place. So the tower had some shimmy to it. It wasn't in any jeopardy of falling or anything like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So we were doing figure eights, but that was only because the wind picked them. So we had to pull ourselves into the center of the tower, trying to get the tower to have a center of gravity because if you're out further, it's going to make it worse. Okay. It's like a kite. You get it drawn in and it's going to fly a little straight. So that's what we uh -huh. did, like that for 20 minutes. Huh? Go ahead. 
Yeah, Steve, GXX. Uh, RFI with a drone, 3-6 site. I watched this happen. We were up there at the 3-6 site. We got up, when we got up to about the uh, cell, cell site uh, antennas, the drone went nuts and became an unmade drone when it hit the fence. He lost total control of the uh, drone. So watch your RFI. Very true. So what else is on the tower? Fortunately, most of the towers, if not 98% of them that we've climbed have only been amateur radio towers, right? Joe's climbed some in his time that have had other items on a microwave, et cetera, et cetera. All, hopefully no AM towers. Don't climb an AM tower. If anybody ever contacts you, hey, I got an AM radio tower. Do not climb an AM tower. No. Why? Because it's always got current running through it. Yes. It's hot. Okay. Other towers, assess what's up there. I did a job for the city of Crestview, actually W4AZ, a few years ago. And I went with Steve Strom and we put up their EWS, their emergency warning system antenna they wanted to replace. And we put that up. And they were like, oh, you should go climb that tower, DJ. And I looked right over at it. I'm like, no, thank you. Huh. Why? Because that's an AM tower. Well, how'd you know that? Well, because the signs around it. First clue. Yeah. But anyway, so that's just that's just a little offshoot. But anyway, so back to this for half a second. Uh, the most important thing on the bottom, and it's not least as last, it's most important last right here. Take breaks when needed. This is not only for the ground crew. Okay, the ground crew, get out of the sun, reapply sunscreen, hydrate. You're gonna be working down there, you're gonna be jobbing. You're not just gonna be standing there going. Oh, look at those guys. It's not like that. Okay, little girls. You want to make sure that you on the tower are taking breaks as well. If you just get done climbing 75 feet, you want to stop and take a break. You want your heart rate back down. Get it back under 100 beats per minute. All right? You want to, and then ascend or then work. If you get up and you're there, your ground crew's been waiting for you to climb for 20 minutes on a 200 foot tower, because it takes about that long if you just climb consistently, right? They're gonna be like, all right, dude, you ready for this pull? No, sorry. I need to take a 15, 20 minute rest up here. I apologize about the wait, it happens. But it's safer to do that than to not, because you can climb up that tower with 20 feet, 200 feet, whatever, and you're in a rush, they're in a rush. Next thing you know, you're dropping stuff left and right, you're hurting yourself, you're wearing yourself out, and you don't have enough energy to come down safely. Yes? I've had problems up the tower with muscle fatigue. With my arm would cramp up, I have to pull my arm out, or my hand would cramp up, I have to pull my hand apart. Yes, sir, that is very true. Okay. So I'm going to try to get this video to play on my computer real quick. This is showing uh, one of the proper climbing techniques. This is Joe, and he is climbing. There's no sound, I apologize, but this was shot with one of the drones from the Southern Amateur Radio Union people. And you can see he's already up. Now, how high does somebody think this is? Just take a guess. Look at the treetops, look at Joe. Just take a guess at how, how, how high up you think that might be. No. How much? No, higher. Higher? Higher. Oh, wow. This is at 150 feet. The same delusion? Yes, and this is before the first set of guys. Or the, set, the second set of guys. You can see another set of guys. What do they got connected? There's not a guy plate there. What are they connected to? What do you mean? I mean, there's usually a pension plate there with the turnbuckle. And that's what we're talking about. That's, that's why, the one that's that was in the figure eight. That's, that's why I had to shimmy. It's just connected to the tower? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh my yeah. Gosh. Yeah, yeah. Well, this tower was probably put up way back in the 70s. Yeah. You know what I mean? They inherited this. Have you seen around here some of these towers work galvanized? That great. Have you seen much corrosion on some of these? Oh, yeah. yeah. On out, every tower down here has got a significant amount of corrosion. So as you see right there, what he just did with his hands and arm as he's going up, he's taking his emergency fall restraint harness, flipping it to the proper place, and then he's using his arms to position and his legs to push up. Why is that important? You do not want to pull yourself up with your arms. You are going to wear yourself out. If you pull yourself up with your arms and then follow with your feet, you're going to be tired really, really, really fast. That equals weakness, that equals mistakes, that equals frustration. Go ahead. You see how I rotate my steps? Left foot one, right foot the other. Rotate your steps. Right there. This is what I'm talking about on the guy wire. See the guy wire and the 
positioning artist. Uh -huh. He's flipped on, he's three pointed, he's got one hand on there, and he's using his free hand to go around, grab both the tower, and swing it back around so he goes back. He's, he does it with his right hand. I do it with my left, but he does this with his right. And then he resumes climbing after he gets clear of the guy wire, this position harness. That's what I was talking about in the beginning. That is 100% the proper and safe way to ascend over an area where there's guidelines. So that's something else. When you're looking up a tower, where are the guidelines attached? Are they attached in even degree angles? Every, how many degrees? 45, no. No, not 45, every 60. 60. No, it's not 60, it's 120. Yeah, it's 120, I'm not saying that. But anyway, so you can see all that, right? <clears throat> but well, kind of sort of fog in the way I call it. Depends on the height, too. But it depends on the height. But you can see that you want to get up and over these things and you want to do it right. But if you're looking up and you see them and they're all like the top section is going this way and the middle section is going this way and the bottom section is going this way and they're all in your way and you constantly have to climb around these things, that's not good because the tower is not going to be served. In most of your towers, every 30 feet, they recommend guidelines. See the shape? That shape is from Joe. That you shape you is see, I'm the in the middle way. of the two guidelines at that point. Right. Yeah. Why is that? Why is it loose? It's, it's not loose. It's not it's loose. It's the length. It's the length of it. Uh -huh. So if you add length to guidelines, they're going to block, right? This video is so. Yeah. Yeah. Since we can't see the other side, there's a, his, his belt is going around the yes, tower. The yeah, whole tower. Around, yes. around the base okay. of the tower. Say this is the tower. This blue piece right here is going like this around the tower. Okay. And it acts as a restraint physically to the D-rings right here. And it's just and it's sliding. It slides up, yeah. You yeah. sometimes have to reach over or you have to yeah, flip it up to get over a bolt. But most times it's sliding up. So you, okay. every 10 feet, you have to look for. That's why you always have to inspect this area, especially this, these areas right here for frays, cuts, damages tears things like that because it's gonna rub we went on one tower job uh i forget which one this was full it, of metal it was, I mean, the and whole this this tower the galvanized paint was completely worn off of this thing it was nothing but rust and we were coming down you know we, we got down to about 60 feet above ground and i looked and i stopped and i'm like dude look at my harness and i mean it was just torn to shreds at that point it was unusable so if i tried to rely on it it wasn't it wasn't safe so how did we get down? Well, this weather belt here had to come out and save the day, right? So, I, well, not this belt, a former belt that I used to have that I loved, it's gone now. It died a happy death, saving me climbing down a tower. Uh, it's not a joke, even though it's funny, right? Uh, but we, I used a leather belt attached to my D-rings to make sure that I could come down and zip ties ingenuity. But as you can see that rope, you probably see the rope that I'm bringing around with me, right. that's called a toll line. And in case something does have that, in case something does happen, you, have, you want to bring a rope off with you. Because your ground crew can bring you whatever you need off the ground. Okay, so the video stopped right before a zoom out, but you can see the whole backside of this concrete. You see how small that right. concrete truck is? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a concrete truck, y'all. Look how tiny it is compared to, so you can estimate that one. So he's in the 200 foot tower. Easy. And let's see. All right, so there's the question slide. Uh, so if you guys have questions, ladies, you want to see any of the gear up close, you want to come take a look at it, please feel free to answer any questions you have. Oh, one thing we didn't hit on was the Rome turnbuckle and how it's attached to the tower. Exactly what this is right here. The Rome pipe isn't on it because it would fit in here and because it's bent. Pinball? Yeah. 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 Pinball. Mm -hmm. Right. This is one of the primary tools, right? And mini crane. <laughs> Pretty it's much. a mini crane. It's adjustable through the sleeve. This end attaches to the tower. You clip it on like so, you pin it down, wind your lock keys down in place. This one is your adjustment right here for this sleeve. This sleeve expands and contracts, and then you slide your pole up. It's got a pulley on the top of it. You have a rope fed through the tube, and this acts and it goes up above your beams. Whatever height your beam is at or your antenna is at, this is going up above it. Not this piece, but the pole going through, right? That's going up above it. That's attaching back down with the red strap around center mass. This is how you're going to hoist down something safely. So you remember the picture in the beginning of the presentation where we had that pole sliding down the line? That was because we had it on a gym pole. We also attached what's called a tag line to it. The tag line is the responsibility of the ground crew. 
the tagline crew, ground crew, has the tagline, and as the main pulley line, as the one side of the ground crew is lowering that, the other side of the ground crew is releasing tension just ever so slowly, and they're keeping pace with each other and keeping count with each other. When it's free and clear of the tower climbers, it's turned over to the ground crew. The ground crew is then in charge. They ask a question over the radio and say, hey, what are we doing? They're like, it's on you guys because we can't control it. We can't hold on to that. We can't get that rope and like force it anywhere it's got to go. You guys are now controlling the descent of this item. And this item can weigh anywhere from five pounds up to untold amounts, right? So one tower section that we were pulling down, you saw the mass on it, you saw the base plate and everything else that was coming down like that, was coming down at perfect angle, right? At about a 65 degree angle is now where you want to keep it. You don't want to go any less than that because it'll just make it speed up that much more. They kept it at that. So who? So there's a lot of people in here that were at the park tower tear down the rebuild, and they know that we had to go stand behind the wooden fence, 75 to 100 feet behind the fence, to use the tag line and to use this rope retrieval line to get it down to the guys that were in the fence in the yard area that caught a piece of the tower and set it down when we were tearing it down and bringing everything into the clubhouse. All right. Yes, sir. One comment and one question. The question is rigging on the uh, stuff you're taking up and putting down. How do you, how do you, you, I would assume you rig everything on the ground before you're ready to haul. Well, that's what this comes in handy. If you read this, this should be rated as uh, 3,475 pounds, this little red strap. I like this because I'm a climber and everyone has their favorite knots. <laughs> yeah. Everyone got their favorite knot. This eliminates all the knots climbing and trying to go up there and hanging on, undoing knots, trying to put it on the mass. This saves a lot of time. And all it is, slide it through, and you're secure. Most of my ropes, I do have a safety um, clip already attached to my rope. So all you got to do is lock it on that, and you're secure. So when it gets to me, all I have to do is take that, unscrew this, attach it to the tower, okay, give my ground crew a break because they're holding this rope up. Oh, you do, you're good. Take so I, load, right, I try to take off. the load off of them for a little bit, and that's why I use this, so I can attach it to the tower, get them relaxed a minute. When they're ready and got some Gatorade and stuff in there, I say, okay, so I disconnect it so we can bring it back up again. Set it in place, mount it. I can unsecure everything, and we're done. That makes sense. The comment is after we had a couple of falls, uh, both in Eglin and other places, we went through a mandatory climb plan that we had a safety observer on the ground before anybody set foot on the tower. You did like a pre brief, was mm -hmm. our mission plan, mm -hmm. so everybody knew well, this is we're going to do this, 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 and this. So. Like you said, you get the top of the tower and they're going, well, I expect him to spend 15 minutes getting his breath and getting oriented when he gets up there. It's not like, you know. Every we have a safety the, meeting before we climb it. Yeah, every, every time. And the guy on the ground, because like you said, the blood gets going, people get exciting, things go wrong. He's, you got to have somebody independent standing away that's observing everything. Got that. And that's And that's usually your, your climber, because it's his safety. Right. If not, your second climber, Needs to be. Yeah. It, it it takes some charge. Now, mind you, this is all climbing as a hobbyist, as an amateur radio hobbyist. This is not professional climbing. This is not licensed, bonded, insured climbing. This is commercial climbing. This is not a business. This is helping out amateur radio clubs in areas that are assessed as safe enough for right. hobbyists to do this. On the other hand, my crazy college roommate, who should on about eight six zero seven. Five two five eight. Five two what? Five eight. We go out there during break. We start the day. We get to the and then sometimes you talk about there. Okay. It's crazy. Yeah. He's now vice president of Dell. But the money that we made, you know, doing that, a half a dozen of us would go out there and help you. It was enough to do pay tuition for several semesters. That's awesome. You know, it it was. 
you know, I couldn't believe how much money they paid those guys to do the big the TV towers. Two thousand foot. Oh, I'm not yeah, sure. No. Some of those so, towers have elevators. Now they do. Yeah. So, so before I before I wrap this up, I want to share a story that Steve Strom told me uh, just before this meeting, and he basically said got my attention on the mic there uh, just before we all started, and he said, "Hey, listen, you know, there's this guy that I know, uh, he's no longer with us, uh, but he used to climb 450, 500 foot towers, and he did everything safely, did everything right, and all this other stuff. He climbed a 30 foot tower, a 30 foot tower top of the over and killed him. Field day." You said it was field day, right? He didn't tell me when it was. Yeah, you said field day. Oh, did he? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but he wanted me to share that. And the reason that I share that is because it doesn't matter if you're up at 200 feet or 20 feet. It's going to kill you or it could kill you very potentially. Or worse, permanently dismember you and make you in a wheelchair paraplegic or something else. Or, or, or I mean, or, dead, dead is bad, but. 14 feet broke my back in two places. Yeah. So it doesn't take much. No. I mean, you can hurt yourself falling off of the back of your bumper, you know, so just be careful and make sure it's you set you assess anytime and you climb into it. Whether it's Kirk's 20 foot tower, the playground 63 foot tower, the Noark tower, you know what I mean? It's stable, but it needs work. I mean, we know that. Yes, sir. I'm looking right at you, Rob. All right. Um, just want to know what the ratio was between the height of the tower and the, and the uh, um, expanse of your bladder. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a so, truck driver, so no problems here. He he <laughs> okay, problem. right. well, I will admit that there is a such uh, occurrence as called golden rain. <laughs> <laughs> just saying that uh, if anybody's standing below Holy the tower, Catherine don't like that. If you know, anybody's standing good. below the tower and they radio up, hey, is it starting to rain? Be like, oh, well, yeah, bad time to be ground crew. <laughs> <laughs> all right so just uh, remember it's not the fall that kills you it's a sudden stop <laughs> yeah thank you bob all right so online with us tonight we've got ron Mon, steve strom and uh bob uh bob wcgda so uh well yeah bob benson thank you so uh real quick what we wanted to do with robert Dallins in the room and everybody else is these three online is we wanted to give peter update on 147 Three six zero machine. Can I have two seconds? Yes, sir. Two seconds. Two seconds. Um, just remember, if you do do a climb, um, make sure there's no commercial. Yes, commercial, and the max height the amateur radio can climb is only two hundred feet without being certified and licensed. Only two hundred feet. Only two hundred feet. Really? Okay? Yep. So just keep that in mind. Be safe. If you're interested in climbing, you can get with me, DJ. I have my own personal tower at my house that you want to practice on. Uh, right now, don't recommend our tower because it does need some work. Um, so if you're interested in climbing, just let me know and we'll try to get you on a harness. I do have a second harness at the house. So if you're interested in trying on a harness, come and join up the fun. Or you can call me, schedule me, schedule with me, and we can meet at park on a pileup, uh, provided that we get the wasps handled. I got stung. What was that, Ed? About a week and a half ago, uh -huh. two weeks ago, I got stung by some wasp. I was coming down off the tower for a quick work. It's not good. Uh, it was one in the kneecap, and I was wearing shorts. That was dumb. If I was wearing pants, I would have got stung. Anyway, uh, okay. So, uh, Steve, Robert, Bob, take it away.